Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to today's session of International Relations this week. As you know, every Wednesday at 8 p.m. we bring this session to you where we discuss some of the most important news stories with respect to international relations from the past week or so. International relations, which is an extremely important part of the GS2 mains paper. It's a subject that is mostly dynamic in nature, meaning that you're expected to read about the news stories that have been in the news rather than fretting about the past. From the past week, these are the important topics that we have taken up. Today, we'll be discussing about the India-Egypt relations. As you know, the Egyptian president is in India to be our chief guest for the 74th Republic Day Parade. So we'll be discussing the significance of India-Egypt relationship. Then we'll be discussing India's offer or India in fact going ahead and restructuring the debt that we had given to Sri Lanka. We'll be discussing the significance of this decision and what does it mean for India-Sri Lanka relations going forward. Then we'll be discussing about India-Oman dialogue. Usually we don't really talk a lot about India's relationship with Oman, but there has been some progress in the bilateral relationship after a bilateral meeting happened just a few days back. So we'll be discussing about that. Similarly with Maldives also, India's relationship has progressed slightly. So we'll be discussing that significance and almost no episode of international relations this week can be complete without talking about China. That has been the significance of China on India. So today we'll be discussing about China's plans to open up or establish a new huge dam in Tibet. How would it impact us and what can we look forward? So let's begin without any further ado with the first topic that we have as we discussed. The first topic will be India-Egypt relationship. Now, usually whenever you talk about bilateral relationship of India, you talk about those nations with which we do have good trade, good bilateral relations. Unfortunately, Egypt doesn't really figure at the top of our minds. However, even then, do remember, India has a very, very strong bilateral connect with Egypt. There is a very strong Indian presence in Egypt in many, many sectors. Historically also, India and Egypt have been very close for various reasons and we'll discuss some of those. The government of India, usually, whenever they decide who to invite as a chief guest in the Republic Day Parade, it is not a random decision. Do remember, it's a very strategic decision. We decide on the basis of where our foreign policy is actually going ahead. This year's chief guest in the Republic Day Parade will be the Egyptian president. As you know, for the last two Republic Day Parades, we did not have chief guests owing to the global pandemic that we had. Now, this gives us a chance to look into India-Egypt relationship. Has there been any progress in the past and historically how Egypt and India view each other? One of the other reasons why the bilateral relations is in the news is that the two sides celebrated 75th anniversary of bilateral ties with India. Now, you might think 75 years is also a landmark that India has achieved in terms of our independence, which tells you that as soon as we became independent, Egypt was one of those countries with which we established our bilateral relationship at the very first. That is why when India becomes 75 years old, India-Egypt relationship also becomes 75 years old. To commemorate this, in fact, the Egyptian government had released a postage stamp about India-Egypt relations. That also highlights the fact it is not just India, Egypt also values its relationship with India on an equal terms. Historically, the relationship between the two sides can actually be seen from many, many, many centuries ago. As you know, the ancient civilizations were usually established very near to water bodies because people did not have other sources of water figured out. India being home to the Indus Valley civilization, same Egypt being home to a civilization near the Nile River, meaning that there was an instant trade connection between the two even if you go back many, many, many centuries. Cut down to when India became independent. At that time, as you know, after India's independence, one of the first major diplomatic decisions that we took was to be a part and a founding member of the non-aligned movement. Now, as you would know, in the non-aligned movement, India was held by other nations as well. Some of the other nations that took equal participation and equal interest in the non-aligned movement was actually Egypt. Then there were countries such as Indonesia, 
there was Yugoslavia as well. But Egypt in all of that was a very very strong partner with India having a similar kind of a mindset towards the international community. The interesting part is even today India usually has been seen as one of those nations that does not really take a side very quickly in any international dispute. Talk about the ongoing Russia-Ukraine dispute. In the ongoing Russia-Ukraine dispute you know that India has kind of taken the middle path. Egypt, in fact, is one of the only few countries around the world, except India, that has taken the same kind of a path. Like India, Egypt is also in constant touch with both the sides, Ukraine and Russia. And that is why it is being seen as one of those nations that can actually come ahead and mediate between the two sides if that is required. India-Egypt relationship, as I told you, went from strength to strength from the non-aligned movements and then going ahead. So much so, that India supported Egypt whenever they were stuck in any armed conflict. As you know, Egypt had a lot of things going for it, especially its geography. Its strategic location actually has always attracted Egypt and many Western nations have wanted to control Egypt in one way or the other. Egypt thus was also a point of threat when many countries tried to attack Egypt and took control of the territory so that they could get control of the Suez Canal as well. India supported Egypt so much that we said that we would threaten from the British Commonwealth if this warfare does not stop from Egypt. Thus, our relationship between the two sides has been built on the condition that the two sides actually support each other. Now, if you come over to the contemporary era in the past, let's say, decade or so, you will see that the two sides have had robust trade and commerce relations as well. If you look at the trade from the two sides, major Egyptian exports to India include raw cotton, fertilizers, oil and oil products, organic, non-organic chemicals, leather and even iron products. India also sends a lot of things to Egypt including cotton yarn, herbs, coffee, sesame, tobacco, etc. Not just this, India has also made Egypt a part of our ITEC. Let me just take you back so there. Sorry. Yeah. So India also considers Egypt as a part of our ITEC. ITEC here stands for Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program. Now, what exactly is this? The government of India, as a part of our outreach to developing nations and least developed nations, runs a program called ITEC. Under this program, our endeavor is to help developing nations, like-minded nations, least developed nations, to get scholarships, for instance, give skills to their people so that they can have more job opportunities, giving them a place where they can actually come and exhibit their ideas, helping them with trade, helping them with whatever knowledge that we have. Mostly we help the African nations and some nations from Asia as well. A lot of students from these kind of nations actually study in Indian universities on scholarships. All of that is a part of ITEC and Egypt also is considered as a part of ITEC. Even the field of science, the ICAR and Agricultural Research Center has been helping Egypt when it comes to different types of developments in the field of agriculture. As you know, India has been renowned around the world for its progress in agriculture. For a country of India's size to be self-dependent in terms of agriculture is a huge, huge, huge achievement. That is why nations around the world want to learn from India's expertise and India has been more than open in sharing these kind of things with nations such as Egypt. We have also had cultural links with Egypt. You also call it soft power, you can call it cultural relations, whatever you want. There is a famous festival called India by the Nile that is celebrated usually in Egypt. It's an annual festival to bring India's culture to Egypt. Now, as I told you earlier as well, India has this great strength that wherever you go around the world, in whichever country, you will find some number of Indians actually living there for a long, long time. And the same is the case with Egypt. Almost every sector in Egypt has certain Indian presence. That is why these kind of festivals also play a major role in bringing the two sides together. That can go a long, long way 
and there is only positive aspect to look into right now as the Egyptian president is in India. There are other ways to look at it as well. Look at the strategic location that Egypt has right now. Look at the map and you will see nations such as China also want to maintain good relationship with Egypt. It is a part of the route where most of the world trade actually takes place. India wants to ensure that with Egypt, they maintain their good relation because Egypt, apart from being an African nation, is also considered a part of the Middle Eastern region. Both these regions where India has been trying to increase its influence. This is where Egypt and good relationship with Egypt can come in extremely handy for us. The next important news from the sphere of international relations was that India went ahead and restructured Sri Lanka's debt. Now, what exactly is the story here? You all are aware of the serious economic concern that Sri Lanka is going through. One after the other, ever since the Easter bombing happened in 2019, Sri Lanka has been seeing an economic decline. First, tourism getting ahead because of terrorist activities, then the COVID-19 pandemic, then some of nonsensical decisions taken by the government without thinking it through, deciding that we will turn into an organic country overnight. All these have now made sure that Sri Lanka's blooming economy has come down drastically. Because of this, Sri Lanka has taken multiple debts from nations around the world, especially from their neighborhood. Now, if you look at the neighboring nations, the three nations that have given the most debt to Sri Lanka are China, Japan and India. Apart from these, Sri Lanka has also been trying to get a loan from the IMF and they have gotten a loan multiple times. Now, a few months back, Sri Lanka applied for a loan from IMF for about $2.9 billion. Now, you also know, a loan from IMF is very different from any other loan. In the sense that when IMF gives a loan, it puts a lot of conditionalities. Any IMF loan has a set of conditions attached to it. There are very, very strict conditions. Conditions can be to improve your economy, to increase your tax base, to reduce your subsidy, to reduce any extra expenditure that you have. On the other hand, IMF also wants to make sure, would you be in a position to give the money back or not? So what IMF told Sri Lanka was, if you want a loan, okay, we'll give you a loan. But the condition is, the three nations that have given you most of your debt, go to them and ask them to sign a promise letter saying that we will restructure Sri Lanka's debt. For example, let's assume Sri Lanka right now has to pay back China. That's a random number. Let's say they have to pay back $100 million to China every month, $100 million to Japan every month, and $50 million to India every month because of the loan that they had taken. Now, IMF thinks they already have to repay $250 million. How will they repay IMF loan? So IMF wants Sri Lanka to go to China, Japan, and India. So that these countries promise, China promises, okay, I will not take $100 million. I will only take $20 million a month so that Sri Lanka can give back IMF loan. Japan should also promise, I'll only take back $20 million, no problem. India should say, okay, I'll only take back $5 million a month. Don't worry. You will have enough money to give back IMF's loan. This is what IMF has been wanting from Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka has approached these countries one by one. China has not been very open to it because if you look at it from China's perspective, it is well known around the world. They are very happy to give you a loan. But when it comes to taking back the loan, they are very, very strict. Chinese loans are almost always above the market rate. They are very strict loans. And if you don't pay them back, they will take away your territory as they have done in the Hamman Tota case. Out of these three, India has become the first and the only country to finally offer debt restructuring to Sri Lanka. This is the big news. Our foreign minister, Sri S. Jayashankar, was in Sri Lanka where he assured that don't worry, we are promising that we will restructure your debt and we have also told IMF that we are ready to do that. India has not waited for any longer because we know how important it is for Sri Lanka. Now, this is also a chance for India to tell Sri Lanka, see, this is the time that you get to know who is your real friend. At a time that Sri Lanka and many politicians in Sri Lanka 
had been giving priority to China over India when it comes to having bilateral relations, when it comes to giving first preference on a lot of projects. This kind of a decision by India to go forward and say, we will restructure your debt first, don't worry, we trust you, you are our neighbors. That will go a long, long way in ensuring that our relations between the two sides becomes better. However, experts say that just $2.9 billion coming in from IMF may not be enough to get Sri Lanka out of all the trouble that they have put themselves into. If you look at the amount of sovereign debt that Sri Lanka has been under, which has been considerably increasing, one after the other, there have been certain scandals coming out of Sri Lanka, there have been certain other issues and the government has just not been able to get the economy back on track. There are various reasons why Sri Lanka finds itself in a situation that it is in. As I told you, many people believe and agree, it all started from the Easter bomb blast of April 2019. See, nations such as Sri Lanka, Thailand, Maldives, a large part of their economy is dependent on tourism. Sri Lanka, yes, it exports tea, coffee, but mainly Sri Lanka is still dependent on tourism. A lot of people come into Sri Lanka, they spend money, that is how Sri Lanka also earns foreign exchange. However, no tourist would want to go to a country where they don't feel safe. That is why every country that prides itself in having a lot of tourism gives a lot of importance to its security. Be it Thailand, you talk about Dubai, you talk about all these nations. That is where Sri Lanka lagged in April 2019 when they saw the Easter bomb blast. Since then, the tourist influx into Sri Lanka has been declining. Then as you know, 2020, 2021 were the COVID years where the one sector around the world which was impacted the worst was the tourism sector. No one was going anywhere, so obviously there was no income that Sri Lanka had at that time. On top of that, all of a sudden, Sri Lankan government decided in 2021, we will become organic and all fertilizer imports were completely banned without any clarification, without any intimation given to the farmers. That overnight led to a huge, huge, huge problem in Sri Lanka. There was shortage of food. The small little quantity of food that was available became extremely costly and people were out on the streets for even the most basic amenities. On top of that, they are still reeling under the debt of China, as I told you. If you have a project for which no one is agreeing to give you a loan, no nation, World Bank, any multilateral organization is not ready to give you loan, you can be rest assured that China will give you loan for that. China, in fact, looks for those kind of infrastructure projects where they know that the money is not going to come back. Why do they do so? They know that this is a chance to then acquire that property. The same thing that they did with Hamban Tota Port. Since Sri Lanka was not able to repay on time, Chinese said, okay, no worries. For 99 years now, your Hamban Tota Port will be our territory. So for 99 years, Sri Lanka can't earn from that port. Chinese will earn from that port. All of that has pushed Sri Lanka into such a big mess that they have not been able to dig themselves out of it. Now, if you talk about Sri Lanka and if you look at their social indicators and economic indicators, you should understand amongst the South nations or South Asian nations, when I say South Asia, I'm not including China, etc. Those are Southeast Asia. Basically, look at Sark nations. Sri Lanka, by far, used to have the best economic indicators the best per capita income, the best social indicators, best health standard, literary rates, every single thing. However, even then they have come to this situation because of a series of bad decisions taken. This also brings in a lesson that doesn't matter what is the current situation of your economy. If there's a bad decision maker that comes at the top, it will not take a lot of time before your country actually goes into that trap. The next news that we want to discuss is india oman dialogue. As I discussed earlier, we don't really see a lot of relationship between India and Oman, or at least it is not covered in the newspapers. However, Oman is a very important, very strategic partner for India. If you look at this map, you would see Oman is our maritime neighbor. So we share water boundary. This is where Oman is. Its location is very, very, very strategic. This area that you see, the state of Hormuz, is extremely, extremely important for India. 
this is extremely important because India needs to maintain efficient and solid trade relations with the nations in the Middle East. And for this, the freedom of trade from the state of Hormuz becomes extremely important. And thus the location of Oman has been extremely, extremely important. Their trade that is Dukum, as you see here, D-U-Q-M. This is also extremely relevant for India. This is the trade through which most of the trade actually happens between India and Sri in Oman. Recently, the eighth dialogue between the two sides was held in India, where the two countries underlined the generic topics on which usually talk about. When the two nations, any two nations around the world, when they are maritime partners, when they are maritime neighbors, usually the points of discussion are the same, that we need to ensure the freedom of navigation, Not just this, we also have to ensure security of trade, so on and so forth. These are the kind of things that were discussed. India also discussed about the possibility of misuse of emerging technologies where the two sides would want to work together. The two sides in this dialogue mainly talked about the fact that there has to be mutual trust and respect. As you know, India has always tried to ensure good relationship with most of the nations in the Middle East. The reason being, a lot of Indians, thousands and lakhs of Indians every single year go to the Middle Eastern nations to work there. Either as contractual laborers, as full-time employees or as people who want to settle in those areas. For their welfare, for their safety and security, it is extremely vital that India maintains sound diplomatic relations with most of the Middle Eastern nations. And Oman has been one of those nations that has always been very, very good to India. And that is why, if you have realized this, we do hold very frequent military exercises also with Oman, which we do not do with most of the other Middle Eastern nations. With Oman, as I told you, it is the only Middle Eastern nation with which we have army exercise also, air force exercise also, and naval exercise also. The two countries are very close to each other geographically, historically, and culturally. In fact, the Gandhi Peace Prize for 2019 was given to late H.M. Sultan Kavus in recognition of his leadership to strengthen the relationship between the two sides. Now, these kind of awards are pretty common. Whenever you want to maintain or help your relationship with some other country, usually the nations give out an award to the head of the state of the other nation. And that is usually for the reason that you worked a lot to improve our bilateral relations. It's a very safe kind of an award to give. And this is given to a lot of leaders around the world, which we have given to Oman leaders as well. In terms of trade as well, we do trade considerable amount from Oman. For example, India is among Oman's top trading partners. India is the second largest market for Oman's crude oil exports as well, right after China. So one by one, we have to ensure that from those nations also, which are very close to China, India also maintains its touch. The significance of Oman lies in its location for India, lies in the fact that if India has any issue, God forbid, let's say if there is any trouble on India, India also would have to look at those neighbors from where we can now start a new front. Just imagine if India is surrounded by enemies from all the sides. And if our Navy or Air Force is not able to take off from India, we would like neighbors to help us from where our Navy or Air Force can then take off. That is why these kind of nations become so, so, so important. As I told you, Oman is at the gateway of the state of Hormuz, from which India imports most of its oil. And that is why we need to maintain freedom of navigation in these areas. I also told you this is one of those Gulf nations with which we have considerable ties militarily. We have our Navy, Army, Air Force, all three conducting military exercises with Oman. Oman also has been a part of Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and they have been keeping India's interests at heart in various meetings, be it among the Gulf nations or other parts of the world. Now, the next news highlights the fact that India has been focusing on not just Oman. If you look at all the news that we have discussed today, there is a pattern. India, Sri Lanka, India, Oman, India, Maldives. The pattern being, India realizes the importance of these small nations, which are our maritime neighbors. 
Because see, at the end of the day, there are many experts who have said, if there is a conflict in the world in the future years, that will mostly be on water. That is why India understands the strategic importance of all these small maritime neighbors and we can't really afford to ignore any of them. That is why whenever we can afford to give them any kind of help, India usually goes ahead and does that. Similarly, with Maldives also, India has recently signed an agreement to ensure them that we will be taking part in their development and we will also give them 100 million rufia. Rufia is a currency of Maldives to help with their development projects as well. As you can see here, Maldives is not very far from India. It's a group of many scattered islands very, very near to India. India realizes the importance of Maldives and so does Maldives. There have been many, many instances where Maldives has had a problem and because India is the nearest big country that can come to help them, India has usually been the first responder. For example, there have been instances of people trying to overthrow the Maldives government and India is the one that has been helping them. Whenever they have an issue, for example, their water refinery plant stopped working, India was the one that instantly sent them help. Because when these small island nations, how they actually have drinking water is they take up water from the ocean and they desalinate that. So if the desalination plant itself stops to work, they will not have enough water to drink. These kind of things have India has been helping with in terms of how to ensure good relationship with Maldives. Maldives is also at the center of multiple of our policies, including Neighborhood First, Sagar. See, India has realized the fact that China follows a policy called the String of Pearls. Although China has never accepted this, but the Indian government and Indian diplomacy believes that China has been trying to surround India by ensuring good relationship with small island nations that kind of surround India. Sri Lanka, Maldives, then you can talk about uh, Bangladesh, you can talk about Djibouti, you can talk about all these small nations where China has tried to set up their naval bases. In that aspect, it is extremely important for India that we also counter this same Chinese progression by ensuring that our relationship with these states also is at par. So that if there is a situation where these nations have to choose one partner, China or India, they have to come with India for India's interest. First, as a part of this dialogue, we have offered them assistance, as we discuss, of 100 million rupiah, which is the Maldives currency, for developmental projects of socio-economic importance. Not just this, we'll also be helping them build a sports complex and we'll have academic collaboration with them. We'll be helping them to collaborate with Kochi University of Science and Technology, where mutual exchanges can take place. We have also had military exercises, for example, joint exercises by the name of Yukevarin, Dosti, Ekatha and Operating Shield have been taking place. In fact, usually you see that bigger nations, India, China, Japan, US, etc. When they usually hold military exercises, they want to hold military exercises with strong nations, strong big nations, so that their military can also get to know about their other techniques, can also learn from each other. So usually you will see the bigger nations not being very keen or very interested in having these kind of exercises with smaller nations having very small military or navy. India, on the other hand, has been an exception in this case. Completely understanding the fact that we might not learn a lot of things from Maldives, even then, we have gone ahead and held multiple exercises with Maldives. In fact, about 70% of their defense training requirements has been fulfilled by India only. India has also been helping them to set up a rehabilitation center for drug detoxification, etc. Anyone in Maldives that has to go to rehabilitation, etc. For that also India is helping them. The tourism industry of Maldives, as you know, is the biggest driver of their economy. If you go to Maldives, you will see in a lot of their resorts, etc., a lot of Indians used to work there. India, in fact, provides a lot of people to Maldives in the form of skilled labor. India is Maldives' second largest trading partner as well. This again goes to show that India 
is not really going ahead and forcing Maldives saying that we are the bigger nations, we want more things in return. India in fact has been taking up the role of our elder brother and helping Maldives in whatever way that we want. Then we have also been helping them with infrastructure projects as well. Their new terminal in their airport will be opened up with India's help. As we discussed, Maldives being a nation which mainly depends on tourists incoming, they would be really helped if more infrastructure around their airport is developed, if the airport is able to handle more flights with state-of-the-art technology in India has been helping with this as well. On the other hand, <clears throat> it would be wrong to say that there are no issues between the two sides. The one issue that India has with almost all these nations when it comes to bilateral relations is the presence of China. See, the fact is it is almost difficult for India to compete with China when it comes to money power. India will never be able to match what China is able to give to those nations in terms of money. However, what we cannot do with money, we try to match in terms of kind, in terms of our helping hand, in terms of being the first responder. As I told you, we run the ITEC program under which we offer scholarships to people from developing nations and least developed nations to a large extent. Not just this, we have also been helping people from these nations learn about agriculture, gain certain skills, giving them as much help in terms of infrastructure as possible. We were the first ones, as I told you, to help all these when they were in the middle of a military overthrow as well. All these small little things from the side of India have been offered to Maldives in the hope that that would be enough to sway Maldives away from these Chinese impression or Chinese influence and come towards India. But again, it is these individual nations that have to decide at the end of the day, does hard cash money matters more to them or does the other things matter that India provides them? The other problem that we still have is the issue of increasing radicalization. In the past decade or so, a lot of people from Maldives have joined many terrorist groups, including the Islamic State and jihadist groups in Pakistan, which can be a threat to India. Since Maldives are very, very close to India and we do not really anticipate much threat from Maldives, this is where it becomes even more tricky. Any attack launched on India from Maldives can become very, very tricky because we don't want to attack this friendly nation. Maldives has also been politically unstable since 2015 Feb ever since the arrest of their opposition leader, Mohammad Nasheed, on terrorism charges, there is still an aspect of instability in politics of Maldives. So we want that to be settled before we go ahead in the next phase of our bilateral relations. The next article is about China's plan to build an all new huge dam in Tibet nearby the Indian border. In fact, at the tri-junction of India, Nepal and China. Now, as you know, most of, or not most, but a lot of Indian rivers actually start from Tibet. The problem in that is since Tibet is now a Chinese territory and China does not have any water sharing agreement with India, there is no assurance on whether or not China will allow this flow of water continuously or whether they would want to divert that. If you have been reading the news in the past few months, you would have seen Multiple news have come out of China on how China wants to build multiple dams on rivers that come to India, especially the Maramputra River. The problem here are two. First, the dams that China has been talking about are humongous dams, huge, huge, huge dams. They have built some of the largest hydropower projects on their rivers. And the ones that they have been talking of building on Tibet will be even bigger than that. Secondly, since we do not have a water sharing agreement with China, in reality, it doesn't matter even if we had one because they don't really agree to or they don't really respect a lot of agreement that they have signed. But even then, since we do not have any water sharing agreement penned down with China, the problem is there is no assurance whether the water flow coming into India will remain the same or not. This has come at the center of India's worry now. Now, the new dam will be on... Mabja Yangzo River in Tibet, which is close to the tri junction of India, Nepal, and Tibet. I'll just show you the location. This is the location. The same Kalapani, which was at the center of controversy between India and Nepal, 
the same Kalapani which Nepal was claiming it is our territory, India was saying it, it never used to be our territory. This new dam is just about 16 km from that. So very very close to that area. China has been ramping up their military infrastructure and the civil infrastructure also in that area and building a dam seems to be a step in that direction. We have discussed this earlier also. China's modus operandi, whenever they want to acquire a new territory peacefully or without any conflict, they usually go ahead with this idea only. Without telling anyone, they start building infrastructure, they'll start building roads, they'll start building dams. And then when you realize this, when you raise questions, they'll say, oh, we have already built this, now this is our area. So that junction also where they are trying to build this huge dam, and since it is so close to our border, it is an even bigger worry. Since it is so close to our border, it's so close to our territory. And China would have the right to control the flow of water in that dam. This can be very, very detrimental for India's interest. Because in that case, if China decides when they stop the water and when they let the water flow out, that will become very, very problematic for the Indian side. This is not the first time that it has been happening. China unveiled the plans in 2021 for a massive dam on the lower reaches of the Yerlung Zhangbo to generate 7070 gigawatts of power. 70, this is humongous. This is three times of their Three Gorges Dam, which in itself is the world's largest hydropower plant in terms of capacity. So they already have the world's largest hydropower plant that generates the largest amount of electricity in the world. And then the one that they're trying to build now will be three times of that. That again is a warning signal for India. Now, how can India counter this? Number one, since we do not have any agreement in place, since China is not one of those nations which actually listens to reason, there is no sure shot way to stop China from doing that. However, if you have been reading the news, you would have seen the Indian government also had plans that near Arunachal, near the border areas, we will also try to build a reservoir. There were news of reservoir being built. Now what would the reservoir do? See, reservoir cannot stop China from doing whatever they are doing. Reservoir is kind of a safe situation in terms of an emergency. Let's say China, without any warning, goes ahead and opens up the gates of the dam and a lot of water starts flowing into Indian territory. For that not to overflow our rivers, for that not to cause artificial floods in India, we can use this reservoir where if the water comes in at a great quantity from the side of Tibur, we can use this reservoir where the water will be collected rather than going ahead. So we can collect this water, we can stop it, and then we can decide how the flow should be in the coming months or in the coming years. So that is kind of a fail-safe situation. But again, this is all just on paper right now. We have not gone ahead and started this. Same with China. Even these dam projects with China also are still on paper mostly. They have not really been translated into something real. Similarly, the news from Indian side also to build these kind of reservoirs are also mostly on paper. There are multiple concerns that we just discussed. First, as for any experts, if the next world war is to happen, in all probability, it will happen over water. Water has become one of the most crunched resources that we have around the world. And with China having complete control over Tibet, that is a home to a lot of rivers coming to India, China has the upper hand in that aspect. Second, the military establishment issue. As I told you, China has long been following the same orders of India. When they acquired the Aksai Chin area, they did the same thing. They were trying to do the same thing in Doklam as well. They try and build infrastructure of different types. Even when you talk about the issue that happened near Tawang, there were many satellite images that show that near that fl flashpoint that happened in Tawang, there were artificial villages that Chinese have built. They have been following this artificial infrastructure theory for a long, long time. Look at what they are doing in the South China Sea. In order to claim 
as much area of South China Sea as possible. They are building artificial islands in the middle of the sea to claim the 200 nautical mile area as an exclusive economic zone. So building a dam, building a road, it is actually the strength that China usually plays on that we'll build that. Once then they come to have negotiations about the territory, we'll say this is our territory because we have built that simple. Water scarcity can be a reality in the coming years once China's dams come into picture. See, when you build such a huge dam, that means you require a huge, huge, huge amount of water. So you will divert some water at least. China might say, no, 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 we are not doing anything to divert your water, etc. But at the end of the day, you also know to build such a huge dam, you will divert certain water, which will become problematic for India. And in the eyes of international community also, once you build such a huge infrastructure, once you have so much investment, your claim over that territory will be much stronger as compared to others. China's plans have still not been revealed as is always the case with China. They don't really usually reveal their plans, but it is something that they have been doing with multiple nations. China, by occupying Tibet, now has acquired starting points for rivers that flow into 18 nations. How do you count that? For example, if Brahmaputra comes from China, from Tibet to India, then goes to Bangladesh also. So it will go from India, then count Bangladesh also. Same when you talk about uh, the Indus river system that will start from Tibet, then India, then we'll go to Pakistan, etc. So if you count all of these, how many countries do these rivers cover? It will be total of 18. Their plan is to have four dams on Brahmaputra river, which could affect the river's flow. And when India asks for their plan, when India asks, what are you planning to do? At least share the details with us. Obviously being China, they would never do that. They have never been open to sharing all that information. Our danger is or our fear is it may also impact other northeastern states such as Assam as well. So it remains to be seen how in the future we are able to counter this threat, whether there is a need to build that reservoir that we were thinking about. And if we do build that, how helpful that is. This is what we had for you in today's international relation this week. I hope by now all of you have already subscribed to our YouTube channel. If not, please do hit the subscribe button. Let us know in the comment section how did you like this series and also invite as many friends as you have for the UPSC preparation right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Jai Hind.